Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. I love Christmas. Me too. It's my favorite holiday. I'm Savannah. I'm Alicia. And this is Burden of Proof. All right. You ready? I'm so excited. I mean, I'm not because I hope this doesn't ruin Christmas for me, but I love Christmas so much. I don't think it'll ruin Christmas for you. Well, but yeah. for me and my crazy true crime brain, this might make it better. Yeah. I love Christmas. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I was going to say, just don't, don't be using pay phones or going to mini markets okay. at Christmas time. I got it. Got it? Okay. All right. Today is the Christmas killings, okay. or some call it the Christmas massacre, but I don't know that I would go that far. The Christmas killings. I um, like it. Well, what's the definition of a massacre? Isn't a massacre like in one place? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's how I've always thought of a massacre. So, yeah. and this was not. That's what I. That was not the case. Gathered. I don't know much about the case, but I know a little bit, like, about like who the victims were. And I was like, I don't think they were all in one place. No. So not no, not at all. Um. So I think you could call it Christmas slayings. Okay, that's ironic. Yeah. With the, oh, slay like Santa slay. Slay, slay like, like kill. killing. <laughs> and oh, we that's don't mean totally like what we're slay like it. you're killing it. We mean like, yeah. not like slay, like I'm yeah. gonna slay you. <laughs> like I'm going to slay you. Although I have to say, when you're talking about killing somebody by slaying them, I always think of stabbing or a knife or a sword. Yeah, I think of knife. But this wasn't. That's or I really not... think of like a, a sword. Yeah. Down like disemboweling. Yes. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. That's what I think of. So that's why I'm going with Christmas killings. Okay. Because but it was I really not like the idea of, of calling it the Christmas slayings, but spelling it like Santa <laughs> slay. slay. Santa slay. Well, you'll have to see who won this argument. Yeah. When you look at the title. We'll take a vote. That's probably going to be Alicia. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you ready? Envision. Okay. My eyes are closed. Okay. It's Christmas in the city of Dayton, Ohio. It's always very festive with plenty of decorations and lights, a holiday parade, and an official Christmas tree lighting in the center of town. So it's Stars Hollow. Dayton, Ohio is definitely (laughs) not Stars Hollow. No. Okay, but I'm not quite Stars Hollow. I will say, like, the little downtown section, this little old downtown yeah. section is, is almost there, but no, like, not really. No. Not really. But is it funnier if I make it Stars Hollow in my head? <laughs> Actually, it might okay, be. Okay, it's it Stars Hollow. Be. So, okay. If you don't watch Gilmore Girls, what are you doing? Go watch Gilmore yeah, Girls. Really? It's on Netflix. Okay, but in Christmas of 1992, the entire city ended up paralyzed in fear. It seemingly began on Christmas Eve at 10 p.m. when the Gallette family received a phone call while waiting for their daughter slash sister, Danita Gallette, to get home from work. Dr. Rhonda Gallette, Danita's sister, answered the call, but there was no one there. Rhonda thought the call a bit strange, but did not necessarily think it might have meant something was wrong. Most people would just assume it was the wrong number and the person yeah. hung up. It was getting late, though, so she decided to take Danita's two-year-old daughter home with her, assuming that Danita was just running late. Yeah. It is Christmas Eve, after all. Danita was just 18 years old, so I'm assuming she probably worked like retail or something. Yeah. And Rhonda told their mom that they can finish the celebration with Danita the next day. Elsewhere in the city, just after 10 p.m., homicide detective Doyle Burke received a call about a shooting in northwest Dayton. Doyle, Doyle Burke is not a... That's a fictional name. <laughs> that's his name. a fictional name. <laughs> no, you made that up to protect his identity because that is really a name didn't. that I <laughs> would read in a crime novel. I don't believe you. <laughs> it, it, what else could he possibly no. do other than become a, a homicide, homicide detective <laughs> with the name of Doyle Burke? Oh, my God. Well, he could have been a mad scientist. Oh, uh, maybe. I think homicide detective no, works I, better. Yeah, but he could have. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna think of other potential careers for Doyle Burke. Yeah, he definitely wasn't gonna be like a mechanic or anything no, like that. No, that's too yeah. classy of a name. Well, not. Yeah, I mean, you gotta. There's just. You, yeah. <laughs> just he yeah. could have been a um. Could have been part of the royal guard. But he's not British. <laughs> no, but he could have been. <laughs> He could have been, um, 
he could have been a surgeon on Grey's Anatomy. Yeah. He'd have to be a world-class surgeon. Yeah, he'd Not be, just any old surgeon. Yeah, he's like a hot a hot shot eye surgeon on Grey's Anatomy. Oh. I feel like he could be an specific. eye surgeon. <laughs> Oh, well, just there say. <laughs> okay, those are my career options for Doyle Burke, but All I'm right. glad he landed on Homicide he, Investigator. He went with Homicide. So upon arrival, he finds a young black woman lying in front of a payphone who had been shot five times. Detective Burke notes that the bullet casings found at the scene are unusual. They're that of bullets that would certainly kill someone, but are actually specifically made for target practice. Okay. Police are able to identify her right away through the items found in her backpack. They find that the victim is Danita Gullett. Detective Burke also notes that while her backpack is there, she's missing her shoes and coat. That's Mind you, it's December in Ohio. Yes. So, no doubt, she clearly wouldn't have been walking around with no shoes. No. And she even would have, they knew, it's December in Ohio, you're going to be cold, you're going to have a coat on. At the very least, you're definitely going to have your shoes on. Yes. That's okay. So Detective Burke is quoted as saying that while the thought of someone being killed for their shoes and coat is horrible, it's not out of the realm of possibility in Dayton at that time. Okay. So they're thinking it was just a person who was down on their luck and needed shoes and a coat. Yes. I mean, Dayton is a... I would say a medium-sized city in Ohio. I think it's like the sixth largest city. Yeah. And it's very industrial-based. So they had some issues with like homelessness yeah. and, and whatnot. So that's their assumption at yeah. first. I can, I can easily see how that would be the assumption. Especially since they check into it and she had no enemies or family issues. They assume it was robbery. Detective Burke goes back home for Christmas Day to try and finish the holiday with his family, but before that night ends, he gets yet another call for another shooting. Never off the clock, them homicide detectives. No, not at all. This time, the victim was 19-year-old Richmond Maddox. He was found in his car, which was wrecked into a tree just a few miles from where Danita Gillette was found. The windows had not been broken and were rolled up all the way. He was shot on the right side of his head, but there was very little blood spatter on the passenger side window and door, leading detectives to believe the shooter was sitting on the passenger seat when they shot Richmond. A witness saw a young black female jump from the moving car before it struck the tree. So detectives interview Richmond's family and friends who say that he didn't really have any enemies, but he also... Didn't really have a lot of friends either. They did mention, though, that uh, Richmond had an ex-girlfriend named Laura Taylor. Can't talk. Laura Taylor. Okay. (laughs) But they said that, to their knowledge, he didn't really have any issues with her. But when detectives attempted to contact Laura to interview her, they found her family had no idea where she was, but wanted her to be found. She had run away. Oh. Or went missing. Or was missing. So they begin the search for Laura. Detective Burke at that time then met with the medical examiner the day after Christmas and learned that the bullet used to kill Richmond Maddox was a thirty two caliber, which was different than Danita. Yeah. So despite the two shootings being close in both time and proximity, detectives didn't connect the two well there's nothing for them to connect honestly like it's just right. that they're two people who have who have died like danita looks to be a very clear answer on the surface i would yeah. say yes and they're very different so yep can't blame them for that no nope, not at all while he's still at the medical examiner's office he gets yet another call that a shooting has just taken place Ooh, the third one that might be the the clue and you're like again Yep. This shooting took place at a small family-owned mini market on the west side of the city where two victims were shot in the process of a robbery. But again, that doesn't fit the other two at all. Not necessarily, but I was just about to say this. Okay, okay, sorry. (laughs) No, you're fine. As detectives collected evidence at the scene, they find the same aluminum casings found at the scene of Danita Gillette. Okay. Still, 
I mean, they assumed Anita's was a robbery and this is a robbery. robbery. So that makes sense. So they connect those two and that makes sense. They still had no leads, though, as to who the shooters were or shooter, I should say. But yeah, I they're definitely thinking shooters because Maddox doesn't fit, but those two go together. Danita right. and the Mini Mart. Right. And then Maddox is his own thing. Okay. That's where they're at at this point. Okay. However, there was a witness at the mini market. Okay, good. An older gentleman named Jimmy Thompson, who sometimes worked at the mini market, was able to give detectives some good info. The man told them that a young black woman came in to make a purchase and that she was short a nickel, so he gave her one. Then as soon as she walks out of the market, two young black men came in with handguns demanding money. Despite the woman behind the counter, Sarah Abraham, giving them the money, they started shooting everyone anyway. Sarah Abraham was shot in the face. A man shopping at the store was shot in the hand and the torso. And though the bullet missed when fired, Jimmy Thompson dropped to the floor and played dead. Which you're supposed to do. Until the shooters fled the scene, at which point he called for help. Okay. Okay. The man shopping in the market survived, and Sarah was still alive upon arrival to the hospital, but ultimately did not survive, making her death the second known death in the killing spree. Mm -hmm. Sarah's death made a huge impact on the community. The Abraham family immigrated to the U.S. from Egypt and owned several mini markets and a restaurant in Dayton. The family, and in particular Sarah, was well-known and loved in the community. So her, her loss was probably the biggest as far as, like, number of people who had something to say about it, I guess. And I yeah. think and I think hearing the news that, well, she gave them the money and they just shot anyway. Yeah. Like, Danita, they didn't know. Maybe she put up a fight, but that's a whole different, you know, that's yeah. scary. So while detectives were still at the scene of the mini market shooting, Detective Burke gets another call that a carjacking has just taken place in the same neighborhood. The victim of this carjacking was filling her tires with air when two men approached her, guns pointed. She told detectives that one of them said, you will die today, and then began shooting at her. The woman ran and fortunately was not hit by any of the bullets, but the shooters did take her car. That's not very holly jolly. No. Merry Christmas. You guys need to go watch the Polar Express <laughs> to regain the Christmas magic. Go eat some cookies and have some hot chocolate. <laughs> and sing the hot chocolate song. And every you'll stop killing people. Yes. You can't be mad singing the hot chocolate song. So the woman does give a description of the shooters, and that matched Jimmy Thompson's description okay. from the mini market. Okay, so we've got some eyewitnesses coming through here. Yes. Detectives also find casings matching both the shooting of Danita and the mini market. Okay. At this point, the news headlines are already coming out, deeming it the Christmas killings. And it got to a point that people were scared to leave their homes because it's not, these shootings were not personal. Personal. Yeah. They didn't put up a fight necessarily. Like, it's just random, so nobody's safe, right? Mm -hmm. It also wasn't helpful that the detectives found no connection between any of the victims, but they still questioned how they could be connected because it just seemed too coincidental for a city like Dayton. Yeah. I mean, it's a medium-sized city, like I said, predominantly industrial, but at the time, this gives you some context, I guess. At the time, they... At their police department, they only had four homicide detectives. Yeah. That's it. So this is not typical. Yeah. They're not equipped to handle it, to be fair. Yeah. Detectives also grew more concerned by the lack of connection between victims because that meant, like I said, it's truly strangers just going and shooting strangers, yeah. which is not, it makes it it's more difficult nice. to solve. It makes their jobs harder. And they just can't, you can't, when it's random, you can't even, like, get ahead of, like, where are they going to go next? Who yeah. are they going to go after next? So the best piece of ed evidence that they had at that point was the car that they stole. Mm -hmm. While patrolling, p 
Police Sergeant John Huber saw a Dodge Shadow that matched its description. It was kind of parked in an area that was known for people leaving stolen cars. Okay. That kind of crime is rather typical okay. in Dayton, especially at that time. So he purposely was patrolling that area looking for mm-hmm. to see if they abandoned the car. He finds it. He goes up. He runs the plate. And he finds that the plate that is now on the Dodge Shadow actually belonged to a Pontiac Grand Am. And parked just in front of the Dodge Shadow is, drum roll please, a Pontiac Grand Am. Hmm. Real good job, guys. And the Pontiac Grand Am has its window busted out and a key jammed in the ignition. And the plates on the Pontiac Grand Am belong to the Dodge Shadow. So So they just they just swapped them and then left them. And then left them parked right next to each other. That's really great, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing great, sweetie. So detectives found that the Pontiac Grand Am was owned by a Joseph Wilkerson, but it had not been reported stolen. Okay. When they went to the home of Joseph Wilkerson, there was no answer at the door. But they did notice a very strong odor. Oh, n- oh no. So they entered the home and found it had been ransacked. And in the bedroom, they found the body of 34-year-old Joseph. Oh, no, that's not where I thought this was going. He had been tied to his bed and was already in a state of decomposition. No. That allowed detectives to estimate he had probably been killed like two or three days prior. Free my man, Joe. He didn't do nothing. Well. Oh, no. Okay. Well. (laughs) I mean, he's not totally. I mean, eh, he kind of fell for something really stupid. We'll get there. Okay. (laughs) It's fine. So detectives also found yet again the same casings as those found at the Danita Gullet mini market and carjacking shootings. Of course, they're working around the clock trying to stop trying to stop these people. Drinking any nog, bro? No. They start taking calls from whoever to answer questions because, of course, they had people calling them just panicking. Well, have you caught them? What's going on? What's Can I leave my house? Am I next? <laughs> oh, my gosh. The boomers. They found the phones. But they're also trying to take tips. Yes. Within hours of setting up the phone lines, they get a call from a young man named Nicholas Woodson, who was the first person to tell them about, quote, the downtown posse. Not the posse. The downtown posse was a self-proclaimed name for a particular group of teens and young adults. They named themselves the downtown posse. They named themselves the downtown posse. They had all dropped out of school and or run away from home, but turned to each other to try and survive on the streets. So you're telling me this is not from the 1920s? Yeah, we're the downtown posse. No, 1992. Come on, guys. At least be a gang. Don't be a posse. (laughs) So Nicholas Woodson said that he had recently been hanging around this group a bit as they typically go from friend to friend trying to stay anywhere they could. Yeah. Nicholas told detectives that they would regularly talk about the crimes they committed, including talking about shooting a girl at a payphone and a carjacking. He said that the gang seemed paranoid that people were going to start snitching, so he was genuinely afraid. For his life. Absolutely. He also gave them the names of the four main members of the downtown posse. I'm waiting with bated with bated breath. I have a feeling I know one of them. Okay. There's 17 year old Demarcus Smith, his girlfriend, 20 year old Heather Matthews, 19 year old Marvalis Keen, and his girlfriend, 16 year old Laura Taylor. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Richmond Maddox's ex-girlfriend. Okay. So, detectives were not only shocked to hear that Laura Taylor is not just missing and was likely involved in the shootings, but horrified to hear from Nicholas Woodson that Laura was the gang's recruiter, often encouraging other teens to hang out and get involved. 
Come on, man. When the police brought Nicholas Woodson in for a formal interview, he told them in detail what Laura had said about how she shot Richmond Maddox. She shot him in the head and even described her. He was able to describe her injuries. Yeah. So Nicholas was able to tell them that she said she jumped out of the car and she, he believed her because she had an injured ankle or something. She was scuffed up. Okay. Apparently, Laura thought that the car would just stop once she shot him. She was surprised yeah. that the car kept going once he was dead and not driving. Honestly, though, I kind of, <laughs> I would, I kind of get what she's coming from. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't at all. Well, but here's she my is thing. only sixteen. Here's my thing. So when I first learned to drive, I didn't know that if you yeah. didn't press the gas, the car would move. Right, okay. like that's just something just I didn't thought, know. I yeah. thought if you I think a lot of kids, you know, and think I think that. that's normal. So yeah. she's just sixteen, and she yeah. what if she doesn't know how to drive? She doesn't really know what that's yeah. like. I mean, she's run away, so so mom and dad aren't teaching her to drive. Exactly, They're looking for her. So I kind of get where yeah. she's. I understand her confusion. I mean, it's pretty dumb to like bank I, on that, but yeah, yeah. I just thought it was funny. Oh yeah, no, it's funny. She, but. yeah. That and the descriptions that were given. I would do the same thing. I would do the same thing. Wait, is he dead? Why is this still going? Why why hasn't the car stopped? How do I get out of here? That would be me. Oh, my Lord. (laughs) So I I just also kind of found it comical that it sounded kind of like she was angry about the fact that she had to, like, jump out of a moving car. And I'm like, you just shot somebody and you're angry that you were... Slightly injured and yeah. inconvenienced that you had to jump out of a moving vehicle. Awesome. Good lord. Come on, Lauren. Laura. A Laura. We don't wanna we don't want people thinking Lauren Taylor's out there. My apologies. <laughs> Laura. Laura. Yeah. While all of that had been taking place, Sergeant Huber, who had spotted the Dodge Shadow, had waited to see if anybody came back. Yeah. And just a few hours. Three individuals get into the car and are on the move. The officer puts his lights on and the driver of the shadow did pull over, but the front passenger immediately jumped out and took off. With no backup, Sergeant Huber is forced to let the runner go, but he stood gun drawn behind the door of his vehicle while he waited for help to arrive. He could hear the girl in the back of the car screaming at the driver And later, it was revealed that she was yelling at the driver to shoot the officer. She was yelling at him, shoot shoot him, shoot him now. So backup arrived, and they were able to apprehend the two suspects safely. The two were identified as Marvallis Keene and Laura Taylor. And detectives noticed that the coat Marvallis is wearing matched the description of the one Danita Gillette was wearing when she was shot. Don't be dumb. Investigators found both guns in the Dodge Shadow, the 25 automatic pistol with the aluminum target practice bullets, and the 32 caliber Derringer, which was the same caliber used to kill Richmond Maddox. As the officers took Marvellous, I always want to call him Marvelous because it's spelled very similar, <laughs> but it's Marvellous. As the officers took Marvalis and Laura into custody and secured the Dodge Shadow, they sent others back to the house where the three suspects had been seen leaving. Sure enough, Demarcus Smith ran right back to the house, and there they also found Heather Matthews. Okay. As police take Demarcus and Heather into custody, one of them noticed Demarcus wearing the same type of shoes that Danita Gillette was wearing. When she was oh shot. my gosh you guys you can't make this up no i kept forgetting their ages and all of this i'm like that's so stupid why would you do that that's but, so stupid yeah. but truly it's they're not yeah. cold calculated killers here no. they're teenagers yeah that have no apparently no real insight as to what the consequences will be So we're going to get into that. Okay. So they're back at the police station. Detectives, of course, separate all the suspects for questioning. And they decided 
that Laura Taylor should go first. After all, she was the youngest. She would probably be the first to give up some information, right? She was the recruiter. Well, she's yeah, the but big they, guns. but but I think they still thought that maybe because they kind of do come to the realization that in some way, shape, or form, Mar- Marvalis is kind of like the leader. Okay. So I think that they thought that Laura was probably just doing that because she was like coerced to do that. Okay. No, I'm thinking like she's. She's a big dog in this downtown posse. Well, before the questioning even began, they learn of how wrong an assumption that yeah. was. Don't assume, because she's a little 16-year-old girl. Mm-hmm. When detectives offered Laura something to eat or drink, she remained silent. When they offered to let her use the restroom first, she still said nothing, but stood up urinated right there on the floor and <laughs> sat back down. Yes. Go off, queen. <laughs> I, I mean, listen, I'm not condoning her actions at all. No. That's kind of bad. That's kind of bad to the bone right there. I went to middle school with a girl <laughs> who did something very similar when our home economics teacher would not let her use the restroom. I remember that school year, she had gotten into quite a bit of trouble, so I think the teacher was scared to let her go. Okay. If I remember correctly, she may have even, like, said she needed to go to the restroom before and just, like, not come back. Yeah. So the teacher wouldn't let her go, and she sat there in Peter Pants in eighth grade. Yeah. That's that's commitment. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, she's committed to this downtown posse. She was, she was, like... That's all. That's what, what I, movie is that? Billy Madison. I can't. All even. the cool kids pee their pants. <laughs> I can't even. I can't even. I can't. I can't. Yeah. Continue. I can't even. Yeah. Well, fortunately, Marvis. Marvis. Marvalis. Why can't I get his name yeah. right? Well, it's not a common name. Marvalis Keene, Demarcus Smith, and Heather Matthews did talk. They gave enough information for detectives to piece together the timeline of events. Heather gave up the first part of the timeline by telling detectives that Marvalis and Laura knew Joseph Wilkerson and asked them if they wanted to go help rob this guy for a car for his Pontiac. Okay. Heather claimed that they decided to contact Joseph and asked if he'd be interested in having an orgy with all of them. That's why your face, your face is exactly why I said, well, don't feel too bad when you were like, Joseph didn't do anything. Well, ew, he did agree ew. to have an orgy with some underage people. So, Ick. yeah. So his answer was apparently yes. Laura and Heather and Joseph all started stripping. And once Joseph was on the bed, Marvalis pulled out a gun while Laura and Heather tied Joseph to the bed. Heather said that Marvalis told her and Laura to go steal as much as they could find, including the Christmas gifts that were under the tree. As they searched for items to take, they heard a shot, and Heather went back to the bedroom asking Marvalis if he shot him. He said, yes, I shot him. Let's go. Marvalis told detectives that he shot Joseph because he was scared Joseph would turn him in and he didn't want to go to jail. So then he decided to go and shoot a bunch more people yeah. after. Yeah, he said that this makes isn't sense. enough. Yeah. Marvalis also claimed that Laura shot Joseph a second time before they left and that it was Heather who hotwired the Pontiac. Marvalis and Demarcus admitted to shooting Danita Gallette on Christmas Eve, stating that DeMarcus said, give me your money. And Marvalis said, Merry Christmas, bitch. (gasps) He did not. Supposedly. But they didn't even give her time. They admit that they didn't give her time to react. They just walked up to her and said that. And they didn't, I mean, other than saying, give me your money. She turned around and they started shooting. Well, that's. They both shot her several times. 
DeMarcus shot one final time at closer range to make sure that I guess that That's so wow. That's she so wouldn't horrible. be able to ID them. She was just trying to get home from work. That sucks. Yep. Later that night on Christmas Eve, Heather and DeMarcus met with Heather's ex-boyfriend, Jeffrey Wright. DeMarcus ended up shooting him in the leg four times, but Jeffrey managed to get away. He, of course, had to seek medical attention and did survive. What's weird is there's not really any information that I could find as to if that happened on Christmas Eve... These other shootings happen like the day after Christmas. Yeah. Did he just not tell them who shot him? Like, did he not want to turn her in? Yeah. You know? Because I would think that police would have also been called for that. So that's a little muddy. I don't know. There's not really clear mm-hmm. information as to why it is that didn't get pulled into the whole investigation yeah. until after the fact. Heather also told detectives that by Christmas evening, they realized they needed more money. So Laura offered to contact her ex-boyfriend, Richard Richmond Maddox, to see if he'd go to a motel room with her and that she would then take his money. But Laura came back covered in blood, screaming, I shot him in the head over and over again. Marvalis first told detectives about the mini market the day after Christmas, claiming they did it because he still needed money. He admitted that the cashier did not resist and gave them the money right away. And then DeMarcus tells them that he shot the man in the store, or the two men in the store, and that they ended up only getting just over $40 from the whole thing. It's just, it's so messy because they're... They're so young, and it's just, do they even realize what they're doing? Like, I know that they do, because you're old enough to know what is death and is like, killing people is wrong. But at the same time, I can easily see how, okay, they killed one person, and then it just kept going. Yeah, it's Does hard that to say, sense? but detectives are pretty set on it wasn't just robbery. It wasn't because they could have gotten away with robbery, you know? Yeah. I don't know. It's I'll be curious to say what what they have to say. Yeah. Because I could see how like if they killed one person and nothing really happened right away, they would just keep going and not really think through what they were doing because they're yeah. teen, they're kids. I mean, they're young. I mean, I'm not that much older than them, but at the same time, they're lacking that impulse control. Oh, yeah. You know? There's definitely no impulse control going <laughs> yeah. on here. Well, let's see what you think after this. Oh, no. I, that's, that seems to be the running theme for this yeah. episode is yeah. I speak too soon. Mm-hmm. As detectives went through all the evidence and interviews, they received a phone call from a well-known local minister who said he could not believe Laura Taylor was involved in all of this. The minister went to the station to speak with Laura. Laura had, at this point, she was the only one that didn't say anything yeah. to police. She wasn't giving up any information. So I'm shocked that the <laughs> minister has such ho- like positive things to say about her. Yeah. Well, he walks in the room and Laura told him everything in detail, including that there was two more victims that they left in a gravel pit. When detectives asked the minister if Laura was remorseful because they thought maybe his presence, like, finally yeah. broke her and she would just felt sorry about the whole thing, so she was, like, confessing. Oh, no. The minister said, no, she's not remorseful. She's bragging about it. I take back oh. everything I said. <laughs> just cut it out. <laughs> yeah. I was going to give you a minute. <laughs> I can't even process that. And, like, what about the minister made her want to brag when when the police were saying it? Did she think that wasn't going to be admitted? Like, did she think that I she don't had th- Yeah, I, I'm guessing she didn't. I'm guessing that she didn't think that that information could be used. And I think that because he called, he found out, he called, and he's like, oh, I can't believe this. I'm guessing the family 
probably goes to his church or something. Yeah, that makes sense. He knows her as a kid. And she, obviously, she ran away. She's rebelling. She's so... I think that she bragged to the minister to be like, see, this is what I do now. I'm a punk kid. I'm a badass. I don't need you. Don't mess with me, minister. I don't need you. Yeah. That's my thought. But Bestie, if you're in a police station, they're watching and they're listening. So if you're telling the minister, you're telling the police. (laughs) Whether or not it's admissible in court, that's a whole different beast, but they know, but they got some good information. Yeah, from her. but they know. So, although fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine, we talked about that before. Oh, where yeah. if you if you derive evidence from something illegally, like if you hear something from somebody on admissible evidence on inadmissible I don't evidence, know that this would you can't. I'm just saying, like as an example. Hmm. Does that? I don't think I'm explaining properly. So let, let me let me back up. I know I've talked about it, but I'm trying to think about what case it was that we talked about it in. It was one of the early cases. It was. But basically, if they if they say they had listened to her confession and they said right. with the minister, but it wasn't admissible in court because, like, I don't know, she's a minor or she didn't have an attorney or whatever. And right. they, they took something from her confession and went and got a piece of evidence. That piece of evidence is then not admissible. Because it's from the poisonous tree. It's right. like if it grew from that evidence and then you ate it, you would get sick. That's the kind of the analogy. Yes. I don't think that that applies. No, I don't here. think it applies here. But I was just thinking that when just I said that little. I said if it's you're in a police st- station, they're listening. Oh, and yeah. Even though they get information, sometimes it doesn't always come out that way in yeah. court. Yeah. That's true. So that was my. A tidbit. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Sorry, it was confusing. No, that's fine. Police go to the gravel pit, and they find the two victims Laura re- referred to. Both victims had been shot execution style in the head. As expected, they found shell casings matching the others found at the shootings. The victims were identified as 16-year-old Wendy Cottrell and 18-year-old Marvin Washington. So... They go back and question everybody again. What's our count now? One, so two, three. So we've got three. Danita, Richmond. Yeah. Sarah at the mini market. Car. Joseph with the car tied to the his guy bed. who was shot in the car. That they that still was have Richmond. it tied. Oh, that, that was, was Richmond. Richmond. I'm sorry. I thought so, you meant her last name was Richmond. So, so that's and then four. the two in the gravel pit. So that's There's six. six total. There are six. Dead victims total. Dead victims. And then there so was yes. somebody else, two other people shot but survived. Yes. They go back and question everyone again. And Marvalis admitted that Wendy and Marvin had been hanging out with the posse and knew about what the four of them had been doing. DeMarcus told the posse that both Wendy and Marvin had snitched. So the four of them picked the couple up and took them to the gravel pit with the intention of killing them. DeMarcus shot Marvin, and Marvalis shot Wendy. Then after getting back into the car, DeMarcus reloaded, got back out, and shot Marvin several more times. Why would you need to go back and shoot him several more times if you already shot him in the head? And he's in a gravel pit, and nobody's going to find him. It's Christmas. That's why. For funsies. Exactly. So, detectives came to the conclusion that these killings were not just for money, but yeah. they deemed them joy killings. That makes sense. I mean, that's horrible. It's Boo! I think it's kind of more complex than that, though. Because it's not... It doesn't make sense to me, so we'll see. Okay, I'm going to stop speaking. So, cause... here's my theory. Being an armchair psychologist again. Yeah. I admit it. It seems to me that there was, like, this group mentality when they were together where they just kind of egged each other on or everybody just kind of went along with whatever. But then as soon as they get apart at the police station yeah. and their question, three out of four of them Bail. spill their guts. Yeah. And basically they're telling police, well, it was for money to survive on the streets. We needed more money. I think they just convinced themselves that it was for the money. Yeah. And that was their like just like their individual justification for what was happening. But yeah. really, 
I think it was all about like we're this downtown posse and they got yeah. caught up in that group mentality. Absolutely. People can talk themselves into crazy, crazy stuff, but I don't know. No, it makes sense. Shoes, they're jacket, like- $40 seems inexcusable. For six victims. But think about like the history of all the things that humanity has done. Well, true. <laughs> For whatever reasons. Yeah. And- I don't know. When you look at the big picture, it does, it's like, yeah, that seems crazy. But when people get that mob mentality going. Yeah, it's it reminds me a lot of like the folio do like the, the delusion of two. Mm-hmm. And it's like you get the right people together and all hell's going to break loose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now they're caught. They're all in jail. And in August of 1993, all four of the downtown posse went on trial for their crimes. Marvalis Keene was indicted on multiple counts, including aggravated robbery, felonious assault, burglary, kidnapping, and aggravated murder. This is going to be very listy, but I have, okay. I have, bear with me because I have a reason yes. <laughs> for why I'm talking about it this way. So Demarcus Smith was indicted for five counts of aggravated robbery, one count felonious assault, one count of burglary, two counts of attempted aggravated murder two counts of kidnapping, and four counts of aggravated murder. Laura Taylor was indicted on one count of aggravated burglary, four counts of aggravated robbery, one count of burglary, two counts attempted aggravated murder, one count of murder, and two counts of aggravated murder. Heather Matthews was indicted on pretty much the same charges as Laura, minus the murder. But additionally, she was charged with conspiracy for her role in aiding and abetting. Okay. Because she never shot anybody, but she was witness to a lot of it. She helped them get away. She helped mess with evidence, et cetera. So for anyone wondering the difference, this is why I broke it down that way, the difference between a crime and an aggravated crime, here are some examples for clarification because it varies state to state. So in Ohio... These four charges, I'm sorry, these four were charged with aggravated robbery, burglary, etc. Because the crime involved a deadly weapon Mm -hmm. in which they used threat or force on the victims. The difference between murder and aggravated murder in this case is defined by Ohio Statute Section 2903, if you're interested in looking it up, (laughs) which says no person shall purposely cause the death of another or the unlawful termination of another's pregnancy while committing or attempting to commit or while fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit kidnapping, rape, aggravated arson, arson, aggravated robbery, robbery, aggravated burglary, burglary, trespass in the habitation when a person is present or likely to be present, terrorism or escape that's a mouthful yeah so let's break that down we're covering all our bases yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're covering all of it well that's that's the and that for you. but that truly like summarizes literally everything they did yeah lists all of the things so yeah. you killed people while in the process of burglarizing their home in the case of joseph mm-hmm. robbing the store robbing danita the reason the one murder charge that's not aggravated is for Richmond Maddox. Yeah. Because they can't prove that she was trying to rob him when she shot him. Mm-hmm. And since there's a personal connection there, the motive could also be assumed that she just had it out yeah. for him because he was her ex. So am I correct in saying that aggravated crimes tend to be like a crime that has an extenuating factor? Like, they were they killed him, but they did it in the process of robbing him. So the robbing him is the extenuating factor. That's what makes it an aggravated crime. Okay, so let me say it like this. Essentially, because they killed their victims while in the process of aggravated robbery and or kidnapping, they all received aggravated murder charges. Does that make sense? So... Because it was aggravated robbery. With it, which is robbery with a deadly weapon. Yes. 
where you're using okay. it or using for like making threats okay. or using force. That makes sense. Then it is automatically aggravated okay. murder. I see. Yeah. Heather was the only one who approached the prosecution to ask for a plea deal. Heather agreed to plead guilty and receive two consecutive life sentences in return for her testimony against the others. DeMarcus Smith entered a plea of guilty with the hope that his sentence would be lighter. It was not. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Probably yeah, not. He still did it. He it's still, still did it. all the same. All you're doing now is saying, yeah, I did it. All you're saying is, oh, well, yeah, you got all that evidence against me. Yeah. I might as well just say, yep, I did it. Avoid a jury. Marvallis Keene and Laura Taylor were both found guilty, of course. The judge gave all of them the maximum sentence consecutively for each count and openly said that he was doing so to send a message to the parole board that they should never be released. Yeah. Ultimately, DeMarcus Smith received 186 years. He is serving his sentence at the Mansfield Correction Institute in Mansfield, Ohio. Laura Taylor received 145 years. Heather Matthews received more than 180 years despite making the deal because she was an adult. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And Laura was a teenager. Yeah. Both Laura and Heather are serving their sentences at the Ohio Reformatory for Women in Marysville. Marvallis Keene received the death penalty. <gasps> wow. He appealed, citing racial prejudice due to the prosecution seeking the death penalty. The examples given in his appeal were found to have no merit because the case that they cited was that of a defendant who was only indicted on two counts of murder, and the aggravated weapons portion of that case had actually been dropped. So oh. it wasn't aggravated murder, and it was not as yeah. many people, and there actually was not as much evidence against that person. Yeah. In that case. So the other example that then his defense team tried to use was that Heather Matthews did not receive the death penalty. But she didn't kill anybody, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she was the only one of the four of them that was white. So he was just trying oh, to say, because he's trying to use the racial reasoning. So he's trying to say, well, she, she was, was an white. adult, too, because DeMarcus and Laura were both teenagers. They were 16 yeah. and 17. Heather and Marvallis were over 18. They were adults. So he was trying to say, well, she's an adult, too, and you didn't charge her with the but same thing. And she didn't, and she didn't get. Yeah. Um, but they said, no, this has no merit because Heather did not pull the trigger trigger on a single one of these shootings. Yeah. Well, okay, I'm going to say something. Okay. And it's a little bit, I don't like to make controversial statements. I know. But, <laughs> like, this feels a little harsh because I'm used to the death penalty going to, like, old-blooded, psychopathic murderers, like Bundy, for example. Oh, well, yeah, of course. And so, like, I don't, I'm not... I don't hear a lot about cases who get the death penalty for something that doesn't feel like I don't want to just like this is horrible and I don't want to say that any of these crimes are not deserving of that that form of justice if that's yeah. how you feel about the death penalty. What I'm saying is it's just a little bit shocking considering the context of the crime that he was in a group that it was yeah. robbery based and not. Like, I know that there were some I think joy killing as well. Yeah, I think that that's the issue is that when you laid out all of that, which I mean, I could only go into so much detail, yeah. but when they laid out all of the evidence, it really pointed towards these were joy killings. Okay. Like, you weren't in this for that little bit of money or for you could have gotten yeah. away and not killed somebody. You killed somebody over $40. And you tried to Absolutely. kill a second person that yeah. was there. Well, technically, you tried to kill two other people that yeah. were there, but the one guy uh, yeah. wasn't hit by a bullet. So it's I just, think that that's where yeah. that's what pushed it over the edge. And I think if Laura Taylor had been an adult, 
she, she yeah, may have she gotten the death penalty been. as well. So. Well, I just think that it's fascinating. It's just, it's an example of a kind of use of the death penalty that I don't feel like we see very often. True. This is definitely a case that I've not, I haven't seen anything like it before where there's a group, but the sentencing is different. And I understand, mm-hmm. I, I do understand why the sentencing is different. Yeah. Um, But I just, it's just interesting because it's not, I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm just in shock. Yeah. I was too. I did not expect. I didn't expect. I mean, I know I mean, Ohio has the death penalty. Yes. But yeah. I, I wasn't. I mean, they killed six people. Yep. And basically, I mean, from the interviews I saw of the detective, it was that they had determined that Marvalis was kind of like the mastermind behind yeah. a lot. It was like the one really saying, okay, let's go do this. Let's go do this thing. Mm-hmm. So I think that's... That makes sense, too. Yeah. On July 21st, 2009, at the age of 36, Marvalis was executed by lethal injection at the Southern Ohio Corrections Facility in Lucasville. When asked if he'd like to make a final statement, he replied, I have no words. Well, neither do I. <laughs> And I didn't throw it in there, but man, he asked for a lot for his last meal. Oh, yeah. He had like mo- like a smorgasbord of <laughs> My stuff. man was feasting. And yeah, it was, I didn't throw it in there though. It would have, I just, went, the list just like went on. <laughs> wow. But fun fact for you. Fun fact for you. Marvalis was the 1,000th U.S. convict to be executed since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. Huh. Well, I'm right now. Ding, ding, ding. He's the winner. <laughs> you get a prize. Your prize is death. <laughs> I, yeah. Congratulations. Wow. Um, so I could find nothing really on whether any of the others had filed appeals, but... On December 29th, 2021, Laura Taylor was granted a parole hearing due to Ohio State Senate Bill 256, which changed the laws regarding people convicted of crimes committed while minors. While minors. The Montgomery County Prosecutor's Office was present, of course, and obviously objected to her release, which was ultimately not granted. I found nothing indicated, though, that DeMarcus Smith, was even granted a parole hearing because he too was a minor yeah. when those crimes were committed. Um, but I did find in his record that in 2013 he was indicted on possession of a deadly weapon under detention. So I'm guessing that that might be why. Well, yeah. Those shanks will do it for you. They'll screw you out of any sort of... Yeah. <laughs> so to end on a hopeful note, We don't know, like, I couldn't find much on the families of the other victims, Mm -hmm. Um, but Rhonda Gallette, Danita's sister, had done interviews, like, more thorough interviews about everything, and um, she actually went on to help raise Danita's daughter and became a victim advocate with the Montgomery County Victim Witness Division. Okay. So she and Danita's daughter seem to be doing well. And that is the Christmas killings. Wow, man. It's shocking because I had so much to say throughout the entire case because it's like every time I thought I understood what was happening, I didn't at all. Yeah, it has a lot of twists. It does. Because at first I'm thinking, oh, well, they're they're just kids. You know, they're teenagers in a gang and they think they're cool and they just got in over their head. And then we're like, no, these are joy killings. And then that's then she wh- beat her pants. And I, there's a lot <laughs> to process pants, there. I know. All while there's jingle bells playing in the background. Yeah. That's why when I first found it, I was like, yeah, this is like a bunch of punks just going around robbing people. Like, I don't know. I don't know that I want to do this. This might seem boring, not boring, but, but you know like, what I mean. Yeah. Like there's there's certain cases that are just so cut and dry that you're like, eh. Yeah. And then the more I searched, I was like, oh, well, look at that. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry if it ever came off like I was trying to like. It's okay. You can make controversial statements. I'm not <laughs> going to question it. But 
like, you're... I don't ever want people to think that I was trying to excuse their behavior. I was just trying well, to no. understand what happened here that made them go from, like, just a downtown gang who's yeah, you know, a little posse of runaways to well, and murdering you f- six people. Right. And you feel like, I don't know what what made these people run away. I don't know what made like yeah. so you also kind of there's that little part of you that wants to feel like who hurt you? Yeah, why are what, you ha- doing this? What how did we get here? Exactly. I so, still don't know. But wow. Yeah. There you go. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. I wonder if they're on I mean I'm like, they're on the naughty list. That Probably. Sucks. At least to Marcus, he hasn't turned things around. Well, he might have since 2013, but he was ready to shift someone. So, Well, I hope you have a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays and a Happy Hanukkah. And yes. that um, you are eat lots of good food and yeah. spend time with your loved ones. And don't use a payphone. Don't use a payphone or f- fill your tires with air. Or go to a mini market. Or go near a gravel pit. Or agree pit. to orgies with teenagers. Well, don't do that in general. Yeah. Not just don't. on Christmas Eve. No. And don't go near gravel pits. Yeah, don't. If somebody says, hey, you want to go to a gravel pit? No. What's ironic is that, like where I'm from, there's a quarry and they do a lot of kids work and like stuff for the schools. And so you can go and hang out in like, these big old piles of rocks. Like little rocks. It's yeah. really fun, actually. I have good well, men. Yeah. Unless they find a dead body there. Well, yeah. Not fun then. So it's kind of funny to me because I, I know exactly what kind of what a gravel pit feels like. So I'm like. Yeah. Anyway. There you go. Christmas killings. Merry Christmas. I'm going to go. Happy holidays. Make some hot chocolate. Happy days. Thanks for listening. Thank you. See you guys next time. Or hear you next time. Yeah. Till next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at burdenofproofpod and email us at burdenofproofpod at gmail.com.